do my show. We can record as well. Great. I think that's it. Fantastic. And hope for the best. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds good. Um, but I thought that was a good idea to yeah. add it to the oh, yeah. list of so we good. have. That is a good idea here, I think, um, because I don't want it to overheat. Oh, yeah, sure. Linda is going to introduce me, and then I'll oh, introduce okay, great. you. Oh, sweet. And then nice. if, after you're done, um, we, we usually try to save a little bit of time at the end, which I'm sure yeah, Blaine told questions. you for questions. Perfect. And then if, you know, if it gets to be too many questions, then we usually yeah, just say, Yeah, okay, maybe do that. I don't yeah, know. If well, I'm going yeah. on too long. I'll just kind of stand up and, <laughs> okay. and then say thank you, and this is who's going to be giving our next talk. And oh, great. And then, <laughs> Everybody's saying that. Oh, that's not you. <laughs> no, Evelyn, will it bother you if I'm taking some photos during? Oh, not at all. I mean, because, okay. you know, they had to ask me whether I would do that, and I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> as long as I don't ever have to watch it or look at it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, you look like you're almost in high school right here. Oh my gosh, that's very sweet of you. <laughs> but in person. <laughs> oh, is that bad? No, Your best friend over there. <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to shut up already. You're good. <laughs> Better than good. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's great. <laughs> So I have forgotten whether I took that picture or whether somebody else found that picture somehow. And I don't know, but I love that. I book. wanted to put a credit on it, and I'm like, yeah, I don't I remember. remember. <laughs> I just happened to have it. I get like that too. I'm like, did I? Take it? I swear, I'm I really bad seen about that. It. I just load things into folders and I go, oh dear, <laughs> am I giving proper credit? I don't know. That's all right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Linda Kaplan, and I'm with the Friends of the Key Largo Cultural Center. Uh, we, we're happy to have you here, and uh, I, it, we're happy to have FIU's involvement. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to introduce Amy Hiesma. Uh, she, uh, Amy uh, is an FIU person. She's education and outreach, outreach, outreach coordinator. Uh, she's working here in Key Largo. Uh, Amy has a master's degree in science, and her research with, was with swordfish. Uh, she's been involved with education at a high school level and with Marine Lab and Sea Camp. Uh, so she's going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Linda. Um, again, thanks for coming tonight. Good evening. And this is the second lecture of this season. For those who have not been with us before, this is the second year that we're putting on this lecture. And we really appreciate all of you coming out tonight. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about Florida International University and where we come from, we're actually under the School of Environment, Arts, and Society. And it is one of three interdisciplinary schools that are within the College of Arts and Sciences at FIU. And most of that is housed up at our Biscayne Bay campus. This houses not only the biological sciences, but earth and environment and English as well. And the school was established to both facilitate current research and expand community outreach with events such as this. The purpose of this series, though, is to share some important FIU marine and environmental research that's taking place not only in South Florida, but also throughout the Keys. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Geyser. She, um, in 1997, came to Florida International University after graduating from the University of Georgia with her Doctorate of Philosophy. She is currently the Associate Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, where she wears many, many hats, including juggling teaching, advising undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral students. And she also is conducting research, as you'll find out tonight. Dr. Geiser is also the lead principal investigator, this is a long one, for the Florida Coastal Everglades Long-Term Ecological Research Project. <laughs> it's very, very <laughs> long, it's very long, it's tongue twisted. Um, and she works primarily on that, doing some really, really amazing research, not only here, but also across the Caribbean. And she's gonna share that information with us tonight. 
So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Evelyn Geiser. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy and Linda, and to the uh, Cultural Center here and to FIU for running this series. It's wonderful. And uh, just to see the list of talks that happened last year and that are to come, it's, it's super exciting and there's a really neat thing that's going on here. Um, and also thank you to the audience for coming out tonight. Uh, so Ocean Life series, uh, you'd think that I would be talking about things happening in our uh, neighboring Florida Bay and, and the Gulf of Mexico, but tonight I'm actually gonna be focused mostly on the upper part of this ecosystem, and that is the Florida Everglades. But a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about really speaks to the connectivity of this ecosystem, that we can't really think about what's happening in Florida Bay and, and um, even on the Atlantic side without really understanding what's happening upstream. Um, I'm also gonna really be focusing on the tiniest things in these ecosystems. Um, I study things that uh, you can't see with the naked eye, but through microscopes are really uh, kind of miraculous. So I'll show you some of the things that I look at and people in my lab look at from day to day. Um, I wanted to start with uh, just sort of an overview outline here. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about the uniqueness that we think about when we think about the Everglades. And uh, I'll start in by uh, introducing the work of, I'm sure you're all familiar with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who coined this idea of the unique Everglades environment. And then um, get into some of the ways in which this ecosystem surprises us. So uh, in its uniqueness, it has these things that um, we see and we are uh, you know, enamored of and also very, um, you know, they're unexpected and they're kind of fun to, to get into the nitty gritty of them. And I'll talk about three, what I like to think of as paradoxical situations out there. One involving the tiniest things in this ecosystem and the periphyton map, that might be a new term, but we'll get into the details. Uh, the unassuming cons consumers, the little aquatic animals that, that uh, consume that periphyton, and then end up talking about this upside down estuary and how everything we see up there is a little bit up, upside down and, and backwards. And um, that and its distinctiveness is something that I think we are all really worried about preserving. So we'll talk about whether or not we can uh, keep it upside down in perpetuity. Um, so beginning with this concept of is the Everglades unique? Is it still unique despite all the changes that are happening locally and globally in our environment? And there's lovely uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Uh, she just passed away a, a few years ago and was into her hundreds and um, was out in the marsh every day. And she loved this ecosystem. And if you haven't read The River of Grass, you should. It's just full of glorious explanations and descriptions of how this ecosystem works. And, and she said, well, there are no other Everglades in the world. They are and they always have been. One of the most unique regions of, uh, one, of one of the unique, that's important, regions of the Earth remote, never wholly known. Nothing anywhere else is like them. And I think when all of us think about the Everglades, we can conjure up images that we can't give any other place uh, that, that offers those images. So. Um, when I think about the Everglades, I go to the central Shark River Slough. That's where I do a lot of my work, um, where we have these sawgrass ridges and, and deep water sloughs that intersect them. And as far as the eye can see, you see these dotted tree islands on the landscape and any storm that might be rolling in, you can see from your airboat because it's just so flat and expansive. And um, even when you're landing, I know my parents have flown in um, this week and, and describe you know what you see out of the airplane coming into to the Miami airport and just how incredible and still expansive this ecosystem is. Um, and finally, all of this water trickles down uh, into our estuaries here and into Florida Bay. And so we have all of our own ideas of, of what we think about when we go into the, into the lakes and into Florida Bay along, along the ecosystem's edges. Uh, we intersect this most tremendous mangrove forest that's one of the most productive on the planet. And uh, finally, you know, into our, our beautiful uh, bays and, and estuaries. 
Um, so we can think about the landscape scale and how we see these kind of, kind of surprising features at that uh, you know, sort of high level of the bird's eye view of the landscape, but also when we think about the different animals and plants out there, right? A lot of them are endemic, they're endangered, they're threatened. And uh, so we have so many examples of things that hang out here in the Everglades and, and in some cases nowhere else and are uh, in, in peril because of the things that are happening here. I also didn't want to forget to mention that we have people that have lived in this landscape for a very long time and that continue to use it in different ways. So we have the uh, Native American tribes that have been in and out of this ecosystem and really relied on it and still do in so many different ways. Um, and the Gladesmen as well, right? And they're, they're continuing to uh, make an impact on the preservation of this ecosystem. They understand it better than a lot of scientists I know because they're out there every day and you know, exploring it in different ways uh, and, and in some ways living off of it. And so um, these people are also a unique part of this landscape. So is the system still unique? Are we still uh, able to preserve those elements? Well, you know, we worry about this because since the turn of the 20th century, there have been people doing all kinds of things in the South Florida landscape to run that water off more effectively and, and develop the land for folks to, to do different activities and to live on. And, and so here's an early art, artist depiction of, um, of that early dredging activity. And a beautiful image here that Chris McVoy, who's a, a researcher at the South Florida Water Management District, kind of recreated what a satellite image, if we had satellites around 100 years ago, <laughs> would have shown us that the Everglades had, had looked like. And so we have uh, you know, this river of grass extending all the way from Lake Okeechobee down through the Sawgrass Plain and, and out into the Gulf of Mexico through our Shark River and Taylor Sloughs. And today, of course, canals, this huge agricultural area, all the development of the six, seven million people of Miami, and um, all of that has changed the landscape so much that our, our Everglades is about half of its, its original extent. So there's a, a great loss right, right there to what the system once was. Um, and on top of that, we have nutrients and contaminants coming in, coming in uh, from this agricultural land to the north, feeding in canals and enriching that environment that isn't used to this kind of stimulus. And, and we have cattail that develops along our canal systems. Um, and we can even see that from a satellite image, the cattail growing along those canals and really encroaching into the system. And our added onslaught, right? We have all these in, in, invasive species, alien species that have come from all over the planet. People have introduced from plants to microbes to great big animals like this. So, you know, we, of course, past, we, we think about this, this question quite a bit. You know, is this landscape still uh, unique? And, and this has been written about quite, quite a bit recently. Lincoln Kitchens had this paper in 2010 that said, you know what, we might not, not be correct in calling the Everglades, I mean, maybe we should have a new name for it because it's so affected by all this. Should it be called the semi-glades is what, what they uh, postulated. And, and so this causes us to wonder if we really lost so many of these distinctive features that make the Everglades what we, what we know it to be. And um, I struggle with this some um, because I think it's, it's dangerous to think that uh, because we are on the brink of restoring this ecosystem and we uh, need to uh, know that or it's reassuring to know that, that what we are restoring still has some of those features that we think about as really a, a characteristic of, of this marsh. And so there are these three terms that, that are useful to think about as we explore this idea of, of uniqueness. And the first is unique, existing as, as the sole example. And that's certainly what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas meant, I think. She said, this is the only place that it looks like this. Uh, we can, in kitchens, talk about novel ecosystems, and that's in this new ecological parlance of, of having um, systems that are changing so much from all the pressures that people are putting on them, as, as the examples I, I just showed you point out, um, that they begin to have these properties that we can't predict. There are systems that don't have historical analogs. There are systems that are rapidly changing and, and 
had ways to you know, have emergent properties, things that we wouldn't necessarily predict. A whole is more than, than the sum of its parts. And then this final word, distinctive, um, <coughs> means recognized for, if we look it up for, in the, in the Webster Dictionary, it's recognized for its, its salient characteristics. And that's an important term, too. So salient characteristic that we think about as an Everflow part and worth preserving. So I'll, I'm going to come back to these terms in and out through this lecture today. And all of them are based on this concept of, of an expected pattern that the Everglades is kind of on the margins of, or maybe is, is completely uh, an outlier from, and, and gives us these wonderful surprises. And again, I'm going to illustrate uh, three of them, and I like thinking about them as things that come out of, of Pandora's box. And I love this representation of Pandora with her box there. And you see you know, rep uh, Pandora represented in different ways all the time. Um, but I love that she has things that would be typical of the things I see underneath the microscope <laughs> coming out of her box. And um, so as I go through this, this talk, I'm going to talk about some of those things. Uh, the tiniest of things, the jewels of the sea, the little diatom algae that grow uh, all throughout the Everglades and in Florida Bay, throughout the oceans and lakes and, and aquatic ecosystems of the world. There are paradoxical settings in which these um, organisms live in, in the Everglades. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the little animals that eat them. And finally, go back out to that big landscape scale and talk about its, its distinctiveness from that perspective. So starting right in with this perplexing paraclating so if you have ever been out, how many have been out in the Everglades and seen this kind of material? Okay, so if you've been out there, you've probably seen this stuff. It is ubiquitous, it is all over, and I've heard all kinds of names for it that aren't so nice, swamp scum, and swamp That's one of them, I don't even like to say it. <laughs> Once you get into what's in there, it's just beautiful stuff. But it is all <laughs> over. And it is this incredible assemblage of algae and fungi and bacteria and little microbial things that all come together and form these floating mats. And they pile up whenever it's windy. They pile up along the sawgrass ridges, and, and um, they can become quite smelly at times. It's just a wonderful community. And I'll show you some of the insides and outs of it. But um, in order to understand why it's perplexing, we first have to know a little bit about the geology of, of the system. Um, and this geological template kind of underlies all the weirdnesses that we see of the Everglades. They're kind of owing to this uh, um, substrate of, of lime rock. And that, that limestone bedrock is really ancient and it's really instrumental in creating the ecosystem that we see. It's full of uh, pockets and holes uh, above ground and underground. Our water moves through it over land and underground. And it has no topography, right? That's why we can see the storms roll in from miles away when we're out in an airboat and trying to escape a big storm coming in. You can do that because you can see for, forever out there. It's so flat. And if you've ever driven down the main park road, you've seen the sign, the rock roots past the elevation three feet that you're going over there. So what does this have to do with paraphyting? Well, that lime rock, really is adsorptive. That means it draws all kinds of things out of the water column. It draws nutrients away from the water. Nutrients are the food for plants. And uh, so that's really important in, in understanding what the productivity of this ecosystem can be. It draws all the organic material, things that are floating in the water. It, it draws that out. It's like a sponge. And so the water is really, really clear in the central Everglades. And that's super great if you're working out there and worried about alligators watching you and you're, like, you're glad to be able to watch them as well. <laughs> you can see them before they sneak up on you. And that's unusual for a wetland. Um, this is one of my technicians throwing a meter squared throw trap. And, and within that throw trap, we can look down through the water and we can see the plants and the paraphytes. And I've written here a, a technical number, the uh, concentration of total phosphorus. Now that is the nutrient that is mainly limiting plant productivity out there, and we have to care about it a, a lot because that's the same element that farmers are putting on their fields and that it is coming into our ecosystem and causing it to, to become enriched. 
And that background number in the central Everglades is 10 parts per billion or lower. And that's a really low number. And we want to keep it really low. And so we have uh, the Everglades Protection Act that resulted from a lawsuit between the uh, federal government and the state of Florida for, for having enriched it so much. And, and now we have that act that helps us keep that number at, at 10, very, very low. Um, so in this uh, landscape where we have hardly any nutrients, we would expect that plant productivity would be really, really low. So we can think like farmers and you know, when you don't have a lot of nutrients, you have to add them to get anything going. Same is true for these paraphyton mats. They need that nutrient to grow. So what's going on there? That's the paradox. That's our first paradox. So paradox. Sorry. And so we're interested in this. How come there's so much paraphyton out there and so little nutrients in the water? So we've been surveying this paraphyton uh, year after year, we go out, and um, this is work supported by the federal government through Everglades National Park and through the South Florida Water Management District and our Army Corps of Engineers. And the reason why we care about it is that we need to be able to tell when there are problems happening and when there are successes that are resulting from Everglades restoration programs. So we go out there, we go by helicopter, and we go to all these sites, and we use a throw trap that looks like that, a trap that we throw into the water, and we collect everything up out of it. And I wanted to mention here my main colleague, partner in crime, Joel Trexler, who is also a, a professor at FIU, and um, he helps co-lead this program of, of monitoring, and also has been just a wonderful friend to talk to about these ideas of distinctiveness, so I wanted to acknowledge him here. Anyway, we go out and we, uh, sample all these plots and we look at how much paraphyton and little fishes that Dr. Trexler studies and, and insects and little invertebrates. We collect all that up and we get these numbers that I'm showing here uh, that are on the order of, this is the high numbers here in the darker points, are 10,000 milliliters per square meter. That's 10 liters of paraphyton, if you think about it, a two liter Coke bottle or something, you know, that's a lot of material within a square meter. So, you know, we know that there's a lot out there just by looking, and as we get into the upper end of the system, we see a little bit less. Here's some data. Um, I'm not gonna show a lot of data, but just to prove to you how productive this ecosystem is, despite its low nutrient concentration. So. We have here in this upper graph the amount of biomass, that's the amount of this paraphyton material. And in red, that's the Everglades value of a couple hundred grams per meter square. And here's a value for the amount of phosphorus that is in that paraphyton tissue. And it's super low, it's on the order of hundreds. Then we look across all these different ecosystems that have been reported on in the literature from other stream, or streams and other marshes, rivers, ponds, lakes, uh, even places that have received effluent. And we see that the biomass numbers in those places are really low. Normally they're a few grams of paraphyton in a meter square. Normally there's a whole lot of nutrients in that paraphyton that Everglades is this huge paradox of weirdness. So, is this paradox unique? Is it novel? Is it distinctive? How would we term this? And we were curious about that, and so we said, you know, are there other ecosystems that could approach this? Where would we find those ecosystems if we wanted to? So we thought about where are the other limestone-based wetlands and coastal ecosystems in the world? And, and there, there are a whole bunch that are nicely close by in the Caribbean, no, no coincidence. These were all formed through the same geological processes. We have the whole um, coastline of the Yucatan Peninsula here, all the way down to the Belize being on the same limestone substrate. Beautiful wetlands there that we can say, oh, maybe those function sort of like the Everglades. Black River morass in Jamaica, the, uh, and there's wonderful wetlands in, in the western uh, part of Cuba that we haven't been able to get to yet, <laughs> hopefully someday. But there are also <laughs> wetlands just like this, or there are limestone habitats just like this, all around the Great Lakes. 
uh, in different parts of Europe. They're sporadically spread around the world, so let's go to them and see. So we started a little expedition with some support from NSF, National Science Foundation, to go in and do this comparative work. And we, we went down to the Yucatan and had some wonderful colleagues at uh, the uni university in Mexico City that, that met us there and showed us around. And uh, we went twice to those wetlands. Uh, we went to Belize, we went to Jamaica a couple of times each and collected in as many different places as we could find. And here's our little collecting crew, and this is on a not so nice day, um, <laughs> pouring down rain. We didn't realize that uh, the wet dry season is a little bit different in Mexico once you cross into the, the uh, cut the, cross the subtropical line and get into the tropics, you get rain in what we would call our dry season, so we got really knocked out during that trip. But we were able to collect all these habitats, and this is what we found. These are just pictures of this same paraphyton stuff. Here's what we find in the Everglades if you scoop up a, a wad of paraphyton. That's what it looks like. Well, if you look at the same stuff in Sianca An in Mexico, and the New River in Belize, and the Black River morass, I love that word, in Jamaica, you can see that there's just as much of it. It looks just like the Everglades. And in fact, we found this really neat paper after we had uh, been down there. We, we started searching the literature a bit and found that uh, some Mexican scientists had done some work in there. And they actually found that evidence for the Mayan cultures having used paraphyton as a fertilizer, because even though it doesn't have much nutrients to get out of the water, it is sequestering them. It has more than the water has and more than the soil has. So they use that as their fertilizer. Good idea. And so, you know, they've been doing this for thousands of years, really cool. Um, what about Canada? So I um, happen to be able to get to these places very easily, because my folks have, a, my family has a summer home up there. And, um, and we found out that these beautiful habitats support almost exactly the same flora and fauna. It's really remarkable. So this is a picture of, uh, Utricularia cornuta, it's a bladder wart that grows in the Everglades, and it's growing out of that paraphyton mat. And here we have a picture of Misery Bay, Ontario, that has that same paraphyton mat, the same species of plant. It has the same caladium uh, sawgrass, it has the same Leagris fibrous. They look exactly identical. So let's look at these data. This is the same plot as I showed you before, but I've added a couple of columns here for the Caribbean places and for Canada. And we see the same sort of thing. There's a whole lot of paraphyton in these wetlands in general, in general. There's very little nutrients in these wetlands in general. So I think that we can draw the conclusion here that the Everglades, in fact, is not entirely unique. These systems aren't entirely novel if we've had people using paraphyton in this way for 2,000 years. It's been around for a while. And yet it is very distinctive. These, this, these data come from thousands of literature papers from these other ecosystems. These are most other places in the world. And so these systems as a whole are unique. They're, and I like to call them distinctive so that we can avoid that you know, really specialized definition of, of unique. Um, if we dig into these maps a little bit, um, so of course we want to say, you know, we have this crazy paradox, so much algae, so little nutrients, well why? My lab's been spending a lot of time on that, and we don't have a satisfying answer yet, but we do think that it has to do with the fact that we have very close interactions between the algae and the bacteria that live there. And bacteria are really good at breaking down the organic forms of nutrients. They break cells in half, that's what they eat, and they, when they do that, they put um, nutrients out into the water, and the algae can take that up too. So there's that really tight association, and you can see here in this blown up picture that there's an algae filament here and all these little bacteria growing on it. Now, they're also completely coated in these calcium carbonate crystals as a result of growing on that limestone. And that's also, as I told you, a sink for nutrients. And they also have mucilage, and that helps glue the mats together. That's why they feel slimy when you pick them up. 
And all of that is a good reservoir for keeping nutrients uh, available and, and sort of a storage place where they can put them and, and use them when they need them. So if we look a little bit more deeply into those maps, take the magnifying glass or a microscope in this case, uh, and wonder about the little uh, algae that are living in there, are they unique? Are they, do they occur elsewhere? Here are the diatoms that we find in the Everglades. So these are really beautiful. They're made of glass. They're encased in glass shells, so they're unusual in that way. Um, so the little algae um, is membrane bound and it, it lives inside that very ornamented glass shell. And these are all over the planet. They produce 30% of our world's oxygen. So you can think of one of every three molecules of oxygen that you breathe in has been produced by a diatom. And when we look at the Everglades compared, again, to all these other wetlands that people have investigated over the history of algae work, um, we see that there are actually very few species. Not very many. They're not very diverse. Normally we would have 50, 60 species in the sample, and when we take a sample in the Everglades, we only have a dozen or so. And these are the ones that we see most often in red here. And they, we thought when we first started working down here, we had never seen them anywhere else in the world. They only live in the Everglades. They're endemic, we would say, because we had never seen them anywhere. This one, its name is Ensionema evergladianum. It's actually named for the Everglades because it's the only place that had been seen. So are these communities unique, novel, distinctive? Again, we look to our, our Southern or our Caribbean and Canadian counterparts, and uh, here's what we see. First of all, these other similar wetlands have very few species, and the big surprise was, <laughs> huge <laughs> surprise, this was made amazing for the people that uh, study algae in my lab and are used to seeing these little guys under the microscope day after day, you get to love them and, and you care about them and you think, oh, they only grow in the Everglades, and then to see them as far away as Canada and down in, in the, these Caribbean faraway islands, it's really wild. So there they all are. We saw them, you know, pretty much all of them at all the different places. The Canadian ones aren't as um, representative. They're far away, they're temperate um, ecosystems, so they are going to be a little bit different for that reason. But again, I think we can say that this ecosystem is pretty distinctive, that these limestone-based wetlands are unusual. But again, are we losing this distinctiveness? Is this something that we need to worry about? And especially when we think about nutrients coming into this landscape from our agricultural industries and, and um, the fact that we have not yet afforded our ecosystem that kind of protection from that 10 part per billion or over number uh, for phosphorus that it enters. Um, so we played around with this. We say, what happens when we take this paraphyton and we expose it to nutrients? So we've experimentally done that. We've gone out in the field and actually collected it from places where it's seen this kind of enrichment, plus 30 parts per billion phosphorus, so way over what it normally sees. And this is, again, looking down on a meter square quadrat. And what we find is that paraphyton disappeared. Another huge paradox, totally weird, it disappeared. And again, the same graph showing biomass and phosphorus concentration very high in the natural settings in these Caribbean and, and Canadian and, and Everglades wetlands. And then when we add nutrients, at least in the Everglades, we haven't tried this out elsewhere, but we see that the paraphyton goes away and the phosphorus numbers go up and it starts to look like any other wetland in the world. And that's where, um, we lose a little bit of that uniqueness and we gain novelty in the ecological and kind of new way of thinking about novel. Um, when we get to the species level, again, uh, we see different ones. These are different ones highlighted in pink here than I had highlighted in the other colors. Um, these are the ones that come in with, with enrichment and they live all over the world. These are our cosmopolitan diatoms. They don't care where they live. It's, They'll live in ditches. That they like places that are really disrupted and really, really messed up. And, and so we find them anywhere we look. And that's what we're getting as we add nutrients into the system. So again, you know, this is adding some, some novelty, but not in a direction that maintains 
distinction. Um, so from the perspective of the purifying, can we preserve this distinctiveness? Um, we have ways that we're working on doing that. The state has bought up a lot of old farmland, not enough yet, but quite a lot around the edges. This is in the northern Everglades. And they call these areas stormwater treatment areas, and I call them a self-help program for paraffin. <laughs> because what they do, this is what they look like when you look at them from the air. Um, they take the nutrients, here's nutrients coming in off a farm field. They run them through a cattail marsh, and that cattail is a plant that's super good at sucking up nutrients, so it's taking everything it can out of the water, and they grow really fast, and they like that. And that water gets down to a level that is not as bothersome to the paraphyte, and so they run it through a final cell that's full of paraphyte for that, those algae to pull all those nutrients out of the water. And um, finally, then they send it into the Everglades. Great idea. It's a biological self-scouring program. Uh, the problem is we need a little bit more acreage to do this effectively for as much runoff as we have coming into the ecosystem. But the state is working on this. What about these little consumers that live in these maps? I do want to spend a little bit of time talking up the food web a little bit. Um, so now that we've uh, seen some of the detail of what lives in these mats, the beauty of the little algae that live in there, um, we, we can appreciate that, but we probably still wouldn't want to put this stuff on our Thanksgiving table, right? <laughs> but this little guy might like that. <laughs> they're looking at it as their main source of food. And so we would think, if we have all this terrifying, that that should be lots of food for consumers and that it should make them very fat and happy and abundant. And so this was the second a uh, component of the research that we're doing both in the Everglades and down in the Caribbean. A lot of this work is coming out of the lab of Joel Trexler, who I showed earlier. Um, and it's really trying to bring home this idea that this paradoxical setting is, cascades through all these different levels of complexity in the ecosystem. So again, all this paraffin ought to support a lot of consumers. There's ecological theory that tells us that we should have about a 90% loss, or you know, 10% of, this isn't really clear here, but about 10% of it moves up um, to each level in the food web, because each animal that eats something is also respiring it through producing its growing. It can't use all that energy just for, for its own sustenance. So we lose energy as we go up food web, so there's an expectation there. Um, let's see whether or not the Everglades fits that expectation. So at all these same sites, we collect these little invertebrates and fishes, and here's what we find. Uh, same sort of figure as I showed you before, the Everglades in red with lots and lots of paraphyton and other wetlands with very little. What about these little insects? Well, <laughs> lots of them in other wetlands, very few in the Everglades, and when it comes to this guy, we can be very glad. Um, we call it, well, it's, it's genus name is Pelochorus, but we call it colloquially the, Ever or the Everglades alligator flea, because the alligator flea seems as if it could bite through the hide of an alligator. They actually don't do that, but they very easily bite through the hide of your finger when you're picking through parabiting mats. They're very nasty if you've ever been bitten by one. Um, but they're out there, but just not in very great abundance, and when we go up the food web, the things that eat them, like little mosquito fish, are even less abundant. So we have a food web that looks like this, about 1% instead of 10, moving, moving up that pyramid. And so I think, again, uh, we have replicated this work. I'm not going to show the details of it, but down in the Caribbean, and the same patterns fit. So again, we have a really distinctive food web shape in the Everglades. It is surprising and weird. Um, why is this that we have so few little aquatic invertebrates? Well, part of it is this ecosystem dries up. You know, we see that happen probably not this year with all this water in it, but you know, usually in our dry seasons we have settings that look like that. And of, co of course the little aquatic invertebrates aren't going to like that. Um, they also don't like the fact that when you zoom in on this paraffin, it's all full of calcium carbonate crystals, and that's 
pretty nasty stuff to eat. And so maybe our little bug is not looking at this as a big Thanksgiving turkey dinner, but instead shredded cardboard on a plate. And if you Google <laughs> shredded cardboard on a plate, this is what you find. I couldn't believe that I actually found a picture of what I wanted to show. <laughs> but it doesn't have much energy in it, right? So uh, they have to eat a lot of it in order to, to do anything with it. So finally, moving up an ecosystem scale to the whole, the whole Everglades setting. So I called this talk the paradox of the upside down estuary or something. Um, and why is that? So if we look at the Everglades, this is a, a dry season picture of the marsh uh, showing all this, this is all paraffite. And whenever you see that tan color, because it's taking up that calcium carbonate. So here's our tree islands and some sawgrass ridges. And all of this is paraffin, and so there's a lot of it, and so it's conceivable that it's going to have an impact at the landscape level. Uh, and so when we think about how this estuary func functions, and think about it being perhaps upside down, it's helpful to think about what does a right side up estuary look like. So let me take you there, and then we'll get back to the importance of this paraffin and creating the upside downness. Um, our expectation for a normal estuary, and this probably goes without saying, water drains from the land to the sea, and as it's draining, it should be taking nutrients and chemicals and everything with it, and as it gets to the sea, everything reliant on those nutrients should be more productive. That's a normal estuary. What we see in the Everglades, again, tons of paraphyton up here in the upper reaches, that paraphyton, together with the limestone, is removing nutrients from that upstream water, except where we have this enrichment, it's removing it, but not at a rate that we can um, effectively control so well yet. Uh, but the point is, it's really a sponge, and it is sucking everything out of the water, and by the time our water gets down into our estuaries, it is very depleted in nutrients, except during really, really wet times, or after a storm, when storms rush the water out. But what we also have happening down here in our estuaries is tidal fluxes every day and storms that come through and deliver huge mountains of sediment, like Hurricane Wilma did a number of years ago, and nutrients, and those nutrients are more enriched from the coastline, and they actually are delivered from the coast to the interior rather than the other way around. And that's why our, our Everglades can be called upside down. Those nutrients come in not only over land in the tides and then the storms, but they come underground through that karst or limestone, holy limestone, H-O-L-E-Y. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, under, underlying bedrock. And, um, and that's moving up through it, and of course those, those mangrove trees are going to tap right into that, okay? They're getting those nutrients out of the soils, they're getting them out of the water that comes through the lime rock, and, and a little bit out of the surface water, and they're stimulated by it, and we see evidence of that all over the place. This is a sediment borer, sediment taken out of the mangrove forest. After the Hurricane Wilma storm surge, Hurricane Wilma came across uh, you know, from the west to the east, dumped a whole bunch of Florida or Gulf of Mexico mud through Florida Bay and on up into the mangroves. And this is like three, four centimeters of Florida Bay mud on top of mangrove peat. And over time, we watched in our long-term ecological research program the power of having long-term attention to an ecosystem is that you can show long-term change like this. Our nutrient levels in the estuary are normally really low. This storm came through dumped all those nutrients in the wetland, their natural sources of nutrients, dumped them into the wetland, and they slowly drained out over the following years. And that's what contributed quite a bit to the bloom you guys had down here in Florida Bay. Not totally, you also had what was going on on the 18 mile stretch, but the, uh, the bloom was definitely enhanced by all this nutrient coming back out. It's just nutrients that used to be in the bay, getting dumped into the forest, and leaching back out. Those nutrients support one of the most productive forests on the planet. And this we've also been able to learn from those LPR, long-term ecological research studies. We have a tower out in the Everglades that can 
continuously measures the flux of our greenhouse gases, mainly CO2, um, in and out of that forest canopy. And I did not take this picture because I hate going up and really <laughs> tall towers. But you know, this is 200 feet up. It's going to be high. And um, anyway, these uh, storms come in and the tides come in, deliver nutrients there, and create this incredibly productive forest that is more productive than our tropical rainforest we've just discovered. So another big reason to care about them and preserve them. Um, so finally, this upside down estuary is hugely distinctive, yes. There are other limestone type wetlands in the world, but ours is the biggest and it has got the most attention given to it. It is weird because it has this limestone bedrock that builds these really thick mats that absorb all these nutrients. The mats are not that edible, so they maintain their biomass. They're not getting eaten down by animals. And we have these marine supplies of nutrients instead of freshwater supplies. That's a, you know, this was news to us, and I think it's news, you know, generally because we all think about estuaries in this other way, and, and this one's just so, so different. Um, again, there are these other ecosystems like the Everglades. This is, again, new discovery. But we don't think that takes away from this distinctiveness at all. It just tells us that it does still have these features that are characteristic of limestone wetlands. And it's a big an easy sentinel of change. It's right in our backyard. We can pay attention to it, watch what happens to it in reaction to the different ways that we try uh, to manage it. And so, can we keep this Everglades ecosystem upside down in this way? We sure are trying through the Everglades, Comprehensive Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Program. Um, of course, if we can, so this is the picture that probably you're familiar with if you live down here. Um, what the ecosystem used to look like, uh, what it looks like now with all the canals running the water off, and what we'd hope that it might look like after all those, or some of the canals are pulled out and uh, the water flows restored. Of course, we have to care about whether that water is coming into the ecosystem when new water is clean, okay? Because otherwise it's all shot, or the you know, hair fighting is gonna fall away and, and it's not gonna do its job. Um, but we already see a lot of success happening here. We have the bridge going over Canyon Trail. If you've driven across the Naples recently, you've seen a lot of um, work being done there. This is a pic picture from one of our LPR sites that's right up by the trail. And this is an artistic rendition of what that bridge should look like, delivering more water through. It's a one mile bridge, not a 18 mile stretch of bridge that we had hoped for, but this is still on the table. We're hoping that Congress at some point not only says, yes, go do that, which they have said, but here's the money to do it. We need that. We need that water moving through in order to see it down here. And that challenge is huge, especially in the face of sea level rise. So this is going to be our, you know this, you live here and you're having to deal with uh, these projections of, you know, this is the IPCC's rate, um, a couple of different lines here, they're all really bad. Um, but showing, you know, with by 2100, 60 centimeters, this is a, another pretend satellite rendition of, of what the Everglades would look like with 60 centimeters of, of seawater in it. So we have to help these mangrove forests keep a creating peat, keep building soil at a rate that can combat this. And the only way to do that is to keep fresh water flowing through. Another reason to do it, if I have to add a, another little reason here, is that this is where our drinking water comes from, right? All of, our, all of you guys are dependent on, you know, the conduit from Miami that's coming from the Everglades. It is how that water is recharged, and um, it's becoming saltier and saltier and saltier, especially in the dry season. So this is a problem of great immediacy, and yet we do have hope, and, and I wanted to end on this hopeful note. This is a statement that was made by an old professor of mine, Frank Gawley, uh, from the University of Georgia. And it was one that I had forgotten about it, but a friend of mine just passed it on to me and, and reminded me of how poignant it is. And I thought it was applicable here. 
I see the future not as a time of trouble because we can get all worked up by this, right? It's a eco beautiful ecosystem that's so distinctive, that's so threatened. Um, but it's not a time of trouble, not a time of fear. I see it as a great opportunity for us. And our problem is to enrich the concept of community and make it more effective and take advantage of our, of our own uniqueness in this particular time. We can do something about this like never before. And you know, if you want to find out any more about our LPER program, there's a little link to our website. And I did want to acknowledge that a lot of what I've talked to you about has come from the hard work of folks, not just in my lab, but throughout our LPR program, which extends beyond the boundaries of FIU. <coughs> so I think those collaborators as well. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. hydrologists working on that very question um, who have watched those freshwater bubblings disappear from both Florida Bay and the Biscayne Bay coastline. They used to be very prominent, especially in the wet season. Dry season, we probably always had a reversal of that and movement to the interior. But of course, now that we have more dry years, uh, you know, as a result of less freshwater moving through the ecosystem, that gradient is moving to the interior and it's moving really fast and we measure it in the 12 years that this LTR program has been running. Uh, we have measurable distances that we've marked that saline boundary line, uh, both in the wet and dry season, and it's on the order of 50 meters. It's, it's really far. So uh, the mangroves are marching in as well with that front. So yeah, there's a lot of modeling being done to project that and project how much fresh water we need to counteract a certain rate of sea level rise. And those numbers are, they're coming out big, is not, wouldn't be surprising, but, um, you know, and whether we can, we can reach them. But we can certainly slow it down. And that's what we're, we're shooting for at this point. Another question? Is that it? if it is fully realized is a 25 year plan. So it's rolling out slowly with projects, you know, lined up over those years. And um, whether or not it's gonna deliver enough water to affect, okay, second part of that I think was what canals are getting ripped out? And the answer is not enough, but <laughs> we do have, uh, water moving a little bit more effectively through our water conservation areas, through some new planning um, that connects them up a little bit more effectively and brings the water to the southern end of the system that can be delivered to Everglades National Park through the Canyon Trail Bridge. So if we can, it's very important that we get more mileage on that bridge than what we currently have, really important. And um, that should be a big help to things like modal animals. I mean, we're, we're a little worried that that connectivity also moves exotic species around, but definitely for our endemics or our, our native, uh, you know, alligators uh, can traverse very long distances if they're not blocked. Uh, Dr. Heithouse's group at FIU is studying yeah, that and that finds that individual <laughs> variations to be extreme. Some alligators like to go tens of miles over short periods of time. 
they will if they can. And so added connectivity should help that, particularly underneath the canyon trail bridge. So I hope that helps. Uh, how the limestone bed in particular helps make the distinctiveness of these uh, various ecosystems that right. you studied. Uh, I wasn't quite clear sure. why it was the the factor that made it different from stuff for a lot. I think of two two reasons. Um, our lime rock is very uh, nutrient deplete, and so uh, it has a lot of what we call chemists call I think they do right. <laughs> I don't fully understand this, but absorptive capacity. And so it can pull in, uh, especially phosphorus, uh, very easily. Yeah, so the limes, the calcium carbonate is very easily absorbing that nutrient from the water column. Um, and it also absorbs other things like dissolved organic carbon, which is another place where phosphorus resides. And so it has an affinity for that and pulls it right out of the water. Um, and then the other reason is that it is porous, and so we do have below ground activity of, of you know, below ground water movement that affects where that balance between the fresh and salt water is going to be. And so that contributes to the upside down because it allows for those marine supplies to move both above ground and below. below. So really those two things together, the ability to suck up nutrients Does it look pretty good? I read in the paper a month ago or so that uh, that one mile bridge might be expanded to like five miles in the yeah. near future. The, that's the what's on the table, and Congress has already said yes, and Obama said, yeah, we should do this, but the money isn't appropriated for it yet, and it, it's a scary time to be asking. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of other competing interests. So, um, you know, it has a lot of support, and um, we are not just our program, but all you know, everybody working in the Everglades is really effectively communicating to Congress directly in different ways um, the importance of it, and it's being heard, and it's just a matter of getting the funds appropriated. I'm gonna take the one in the back, and then I'll. Yeah. Um, one of your one of your uh, slides quote is why in kitchen. Are they? Yeah, um, there are scientists uh, who have worked in and out of the Everglades for a long while, and um, they're out of, I think, the, uh oh. Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly where they're from because they might be wrong. <laughs> but I can look them up afterward. I, they're, they're within the state of Florida, I believe. And they're working as you know, pure scientists on. Um, these ideas of how we should think about the Everglades as it's changing in, in response to the interactions in the environment. And that paper is, it, it, if you Google it, it's Wagon Kitchens, they're widely available now. I, I wondered about the migration of the pine nuts now. Mm. Pythons are going to go where they went, despite what we do with our canal system. <laughs> We've realized that. <laughs> We've already found them. That picture that I showed you is out in our mangrove site where we have that tower and the little, uh, there was a little um, uh, solar panel there that it was coiled around and our technicians had to unwrap it and, <laughs> and they killed it. But you're supposed to kill them when you see them up there. Um, but that was all the way down in the mangroves. So they're all over. They are everywhere in this ecosystem. The, the big one that hit the news a long time ago that had the, the snake with the alligator inside of it and had eaten a five and a half foot one or something that was all over the New York Times. That was one of our field crews that noticed it from the sky, from the helicopter in the middle of the Everglades. So they're definitely no longer around the edges. The best thing we can hope for is a bunch more freeze uh, days like we had in 2010 and 2011, very, very cold nights, um, a few days in a row, and those really knocked the population back. A lot of the adults, a lot of the big ones died in that. So 
and a lot of our endangered and exotic species have come from these tropical areas and they're invading quickly you know because it feels like the tropics here but occasionally we do get these freezes and it knocks them out so you know maybe with a couple of cold nights we can knock them back a little bit but i think they're they're there we're gonna have to deal with them the original SERP plan, and there was a provision for SDA, these wells, that they would pump excess water mm. from the ground. So I, to your knowledge, is that, is that still a factor in the SERP plan? Yes, I believe it still is the deep groundwater storage. And um, yeah, it's one place to keep it safe from you know, leaking out in other ways. And yeah, yeah, and I've seen a lot of different evaluations of how the size of those and how expansive they'll be, and I'm not sure it's completely nailed down yet. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of progressive uh, legislation come out in terms of incentive to, to deal with the metal leakers. Oh, yeah. Uh, to deal with uh, in reference to like tax properties. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm curious as, as to if uh, human intervention has had any sort of noticeable effect the removal of metal leakers yeah. with their water storage. Absolutely. It, the National Park Service has put a lot of money into that invasive, well, all the invasive trees because they were encroaching so fast and they were really threatening all the endangered species of our tree animals that it was a huge problem and, and still is a bit of a problem, but they've tackled it really effectively. And you probably notice as you drive around, the levees of the Everglades, that's where these trees are most abundant, and um, they knock them back really effectively. Now, of course, they're using different sprays that are short-term effective herbicides, and those trees die, and, and yet the seed bed is still there, and they cannot, you know, so we see these little saplings. So they have to reapply until that's kind of tapered off, but it's really effective. It's amazing, flying around, we do a lot of helicoptering out there, to get to our sites, that's mainly because we can't get around by air road in the national parks and all that. Anyway, it's a neat way to see the Everglades because you can look down and see these patches of old tree islands that were completely encroached by Malaluca and other invasive trees and that have just been completely restored. You know, you see the dead wood laying on the ground, but the trees are coming up that are in need of treatment. So, super effective. Great question. Any others, or we can talk afterwards as well. <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Evelyn Geyser for coming again. She did an amazing job. <laughs> you guys have questions? She'll be here afterwards to talk. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody that uh, we do not have a December talk, but we do have a January talk. And that's going to be with Dr. Mike Heithouse. He studies um, alligators and bull sharks in the Everglades. And that lady up there actually very much alluded to what he's going to be speaking about come January. So he's going to talk about the migration of the bull sharks and the alligators and how possibly the